What's up guys, my name is Michael and welcome to my YouTube channel. So today we're going to talk about object-oriented analysis and design. So it's really easy to become so focused on the syntax of C++ and not really like lose sight of the techniques to really build programs. So I'm actually not going to do any code writing this video. We're just going to talk about the design process and just how to use object-oriented analysis to understand the problems we're trying to solve and how to use object-oriented design to create a solution and how to use the UML diagrams to document your analysis and design. UML stands for Unified Modeling Language. So the thing is about object-oriented programming is that if complexity is to be managed, the model of the universe must be created. All right, so the goal is to actually create meaningful models from the real world so you can write code that actually like models a real object in the real world. So such an abstraction would be easier if and reflect the real world if the model could be used to predict the behavior of things in the real world. So like a child's globe is a classic model. The model isn't the real thing, but a child's globe can never be confused with the earth. But one maps the other one well that you can learn about the earth just by studying the globe. So there are significant simplifications. A daughter's globe never has rain, a flood, or so forth, but you could use her globe to predict how long it takes to fly from your home to Indianapolis if you ever want to do that. So a model that is not simpler than the thing being modeled is not much use. So you want to create the simplest model of these real-world objects in your programs for an object-oriented analysis design. So object-oriented software design is about creating good models and it consists of two significant pieces, the modeling language and a process. So object or uh, so software design, the modeling language, the modeling language is the least important aspect of object-oriented analysis and design. Unfortunately, it tends to get the most attention. A modeling language is nothing more than a convention for representing a model in some other medium such as a paper or a computer system and in some format such as graphics text or symbols for example you could easily decide to draw your cl classes as triangles and draw the inheritance relationship as a dotted line if so you might model a geranium as shown in this so geranium is a type of flower right i don't know in this figure, you see that geranium is a special kind of flower. If you and I agree to draw our inheritance diagrams like this, you'll understand each other perfectly. Over time, we'll probably want to model lots of complex relationships, and so we'll develop our own complicated sets of diagramming conventions and rules. Of course, we'll need to explain our convention to everyone else with whom we work, and each new employee or collaborator will have to learn our conventions. We might interact with other companies that have their own conventions, and we'll need to allow time to negotiate a common convention and to compensate for the inevitable under misunderstandings. It would be more convenient if everyone in the industry agreed on a common language to draw your model diagrams for your whatever your coding, whatever your design is for your project or solution or whatever. So the lingua fauna of software analysis and design is a UML diagram, and this is the unified modeling language. The job of the UML specification is to answer questions such as how should we draw an inheritance relationship geranium drawn in this figure would be drawn in a uml as shown above so here geranium points to flower because geranium is a type of flower that's why they draw this like this so when they draw the uh, when they create their classes they'll be like okay i'll create the base class first of flower then i'll inherit everything from flower and geranium so in UML, classes are drawn as rectangles, and inheritance is drawn as a line with an arrowhead. So interesting, the arrowhead points from more specialized class to the more general class. So the direction of the arrowhead can be counterintuitive, but it doesn't matter as long as we all agree that after we learn the representation, we can communicate. The details of UML are rather straightforward. The diagrams generally are not hard to use or to understand, and you'll learn about them as they are represented. Although it is possible to write a whole book on UML, the truth is that 90% of the time you only need to know a small set of UML notation, and that subset is easily learned. The software design, the process. The process of object-oriented analysis and design is more complicated 
and important than the modeling language. Of course, it is ironic that you hear much or less about it. That is because the debate about modeling languages is pretty much settled. As industry, it has been decided that UML is pri the primary standard to be used. The debate about process, however, rages on. A method is a modeling language and a process. A method is often inherently inco incorrectly in in referred to as a methodology, but methodology is a study of methods. Method methodologist is someone who develops or studies one or, or two methods. Typically, methodologists develop and publish their own works. A few of these methodologists are Gray and E. Bush, who create the Bush method, Jacobson, who develop object oriented software engineering, and James Rambeau, who developed object modeling technology. Together, all these three men have cre created something called the Rational Unified Process, known as object theory a method and a commercial product from rational software. All these men have employed uh, an IBM rational software division, which they are affectionately known as the three amigos. So this basically is just talking about like the people who created the design process, the design methods of how they designed their software. And then these three people have created this certain type of design method to do to create their whatever software they want to do so today's lessons follows their process rather than adherent to academic theory so we're going to just learn their process of designing software other methods have something to offer and but you'll learn the bits and pieces that are valuable to use stitching together creates a workable framework so not every practitioner agrees with this approach and you are encouraged to read the extensive literature on software engineering practice to determine what you think is the best practice if you work for a software engineering company that follows a specific method of their own official practice, you need to prepare to follow that method to the level of compliance they require. The software design process can be iterative. So in that case, as software is developed, you go through the entire process repeatedly. As you strive to enhance your understanding of the requirements, design directs the implementation, but the details uncovered during implementation feedback into the design. In this approach, you should not try to develop any sizable project in a single orderly straight line. Rather, you should iterate over pieces of the project, constantly improving your design and refining your implementation. Waterfall versus iterative. Iterative development can be distinguished from waterfall development. In waterfall development, the output of one stage becomes the input of the next, just like you can go easily go up to a waterfall. This type of development, there's no way to go back to the previous stages. In in a waterfall development process, the requirements are detailed and the clients sign off. And yes, this is what I want. The requirements are then passed on to the designer, set into stone. The designer creates the design in a wonder to hold on to it and passes off to the program who implements the design. The program in turn hands the code to the QA person who tests the code and then releases it to the customer. Great in theory, but this is disastrous in practice. So the difference between iterative and waterfall is that waterfall, they go through each individual stage. So they go like analysis, then they Alec, they first analyze all the requirements and they're done. They don't go back to it. Then they do the design and then they're done and they don't go back to it. Then they pass it on to the guy who implements it, the programmer, and then they test it and then they, they sell it, whatever. But this is not, it's not really, it's not, it's good in theory, but it's not really, it's not, it's not like convenient. It's not like, it's, it's just not, it's not, it's, it's really dangerous in practice. So that's the problem. So that's why they do something called iterative development, where they repeatedly go through the process of going back to design, changing it, resizing it, you know, as you enhance your understanding of the requirements. And they go through the project constantly improving their design and refining their implementation. So here's the process of the iterative development. In iterative development, you start with a concept, an idea that you want to build as the details are examined, the, the vision grows and evolves. When you have a good start on the requirements, you begin the design knowing very well that the questions that arise during design might cause modifications back in the requirements. As you work on design, you can also begin prototyping and then implementing the product. The issues that are, arise in development feed back into design and you might even influence your understanding of the requirements. Most important, you design and implement the only pieces of the full product, iterating over the design and imp implementation phases repeatedly. Although the steps of the process are repeatedly, iteratively, it is nearly impossible to describe them in a cyclical manner. Therefore, the following list describes them in the sequence. So you conceptualize, you have a whole vision, what you want to build. It is a single sentence that describes the idea. 
you analyze all the requirements needed to build the thing. Then you have a design. This is the process of creating the model of your classes from which you will generate your code. Then you have the implementation, which is written in the code, for example, C++. And you have testing. Testing is what making sure that you did it right. And then rollout is giving it to your customers. So these are not the same phases of the rational unified process, which are inception, elaboration, construction, transition, or the workflows of the rational unified process, which are business modeling, requirements, analysis and design, implementation, test, deployment, configuration, and change management, project man management, and environment. Don't misunderstand. In reality, you run through each of these steps many times during the course of the development of a single product. The iterative pro development process is just hard to represent and understand if you cycle through each step. So this process should sound easy. All the rest of today's lesson simply the details. Controversies. Endless controversies exist on what happens in each stage of the iterative design process and even about what you need those stages. The, it doesn't matter. The essential steps are the same in just about any object-oriented process. Find out what you need to build, design a solution, implement that design. Although the news groups and object technology mailing list thrives on splitting hairs, the essentials of object-oriented analysis and design are fairly straightforward. The lesson lays out a practical approach to the process as a bedrock on which you can build the architecture of your application. The goal of all this work is to produce code that meets the stated requirements and that is reliable, extensible, and maintainable. Most important, the goal is to produce high quality code on time and on a budget. So conceptualizing phase, start with a vision. All great software begins with a vision. One individual has an insight into the product he thinks would be good to build. In a business, someone envisions a product or service he wants the business to create or offer. Rarely do committees create compelling visions. The very first phase of object-oriented design and analysis is to capture this vision in a single sentence. The vision becomes the guiding principle of development and the team that comes together to implement the vision ought to refer back to it and update it if necessary as it goes forward. Even if the vision statement comes out of a committee in the marketing department, one person should be designated as the visionary. It is her job to be the keeper of the sacred light. As you process, prog uh, as you progress, as you progress, the requirements will evolve. The scheduling and time to market demands might and modify what you want to accomplish. The first iteration of the program, but the visionary keeps an eye on the essential idea to ensure that whatever is produced reflects the core vision with high fidelity. It is this ruthless dedication, that this passionate commitment, that sees the project through to completion. If you lose sight of the vision, your project is doomed conceptualization phase in which the vision is articulated is very brief it might be no longer than a flash of insight followed by the time it takes to write down what the visionary has in mind in other projects the vision requires a complex and sometimes challenging scoping phase in which agreement on the components of the vision might be generated between the people or groups involved in such a process what's in and what's out can be a key determinant of the success of the project be essentially because this effort is usually when initial estimates of costs are set often as the object oriented expert you join the project after the vision has been articulated wow so you need a vision okay whoever has to, who someone has to have a vision of what the end product looks like so if you if you lose sight of that vision then, then you're doomed no matter what changes they have to keep the vision the same Step two, the analysis phase, gathering requirements. Some companies confuse the vision statement with the requirements. A strong vision is necessary, but it is not sufficient. To move on to design, you must understand how the product will be used and how it, it will perform. The goal of this analysis phase is to articulate and capture these requirements. The outcome of the analysis phase is the production of a requirements document. The first section in the requirements document is the user case analysis. Use cases. The driving force in design implementation and analysis is the use case a use case is nothing more than a high level description of how the product will be used okay a, high, a, dis, a description of how the product will be used use cases drive not only the analysis but they also drive the design they help you determine the classes that are essentially important in testing the product creating a robust and comp comprehensive set of 
use cases might be a, the single and most important task in analysis. It is here that you depend most heavily on your domain experts, those experts having the most Im information about the business requirements you are trying to capture. Use cases pay little attention to the details of the user interface. They pay no attention to the internals of the system you're building. Rather, they should be focused on the interactions with that need to occur between the people and the systems called actors that will work together to produce the desired results. So in summary, here are the definitions. A use case is a description of how the software will be used. Domain experts are people with expertise in the domain areas of business for which you are creating the product. Okay, an actor is any person or system that interacts with the system you are developing. A use case is a description of the interaction between the actor and the system itself. For purposes of use case analysis, the system is treated as a black box. An actor sends a message to the system, something happens, information is returned, the state of the system is changed, the spaceship changes direction, whatever happens. Use cases are not sufficient to capture all the requirements. They are a key component and often receive the most attention. Other items such as business rules, data elements, and technical requirements for performance, security, and so on. So, use case is just the interactions between the actor and the system. So, between the user and the system, between whatever is happening in the system. It's, it's not just the user interface. It's just whatever is happening in the system. That's what a use case is. Okay, identifying the actors. It is important to note that not all actors are people. Systems that inter or interact with the system you are building are also called actors. Thus, if you are building an automated teller machine, ATM, the customer, and the bank clerk can be actors, but there are other systems that the new system interacts, such as the mortgage tracking or student loan system. The central characteristics of actors are following. They are external to the system. They interact with the system. Getting started is the hardest part of the use case analysis. The best way to get going is to brainstorm. Simply write down the list of people and systems that interact with your new system. Remember that people really need roles. The bank clerk, the manager, the customer, and so forth. One person can more have more than one role. For the ATM example, just mentioned the list of roles would include the following, the customer, the bank personnel, the back office system, the person who fills the ATM with machines and with money and supplies. Whoops, my bad. The person who fills the ATM with money and supplies. No need to go beyond the first list at first. Generating even three or more four actors might be enough to get you started on generating use cases. So just having the whatever the roles of people interacting is fine with whatever system is interacting can help you generate use cases each of these actors interact with the system in a different way you need to capture these interactions in the use cases determining the first use cases you have to start somewhere for the atm for example start with the customer role what are the actions of the customer's role brainstorming could lead to us to use cases for the customer well the customers have to check his balances customers deposits money into his account Customers withdraws money from his account. Customers transfers money between accounts. Customers opens an account. Customers closes an account. Should you distinguish between customer deposits checking an account and customers deposits money in a savings account, or should you use these actions to combine as into customers deposit money in his account? The question in this answer relies on whether this distinction is meaningful in the domain. The domain is the real world environment being modeled, in this case banking. To determine whether these actions are one, use case or two, you must ask whether their mechanisms are different. Does the customer do anything significantly, significantly different with these deposits and whether the outcomes are different? Does the, mach the machine, the system rely in a different way? The answer to these both questions for the deposit issue is no. The customer deposits money in either account in essentially the same way and the outcome is pretty much the same. The ATM responds by incrementing the balance in the appropriate account. Given that the actor and balance behave and respond more or less identically, regardless of whether the deposit is being made to the checkings or the savings accounts, these two use cases are actually a single use case. Later, when the use case scenarios are fleshed out, you can try the two variations to see whether they make any difference at all. Are you thinking about each actor? You might discover additional use cases by asking these questions. Why is the actor using the system? The customer is using the system to get cash, to make a deposit, or to check an account balance. What outcome does the actor want or expect from each request? Add cash to a, an account or to get cash to make a, a purchase. What happens to the actor to use the system now? She might recently have been paid or have been in one way make a purchase. What might the actor do 
What must the actor do to use the system? Identify herself by putting an ATM card into the slot machine, and then we use a use case for the customer logging into the system. What personal information must the actor provide to the system? Personal ID number. We use a use case for obtaining and editing the personal ID number. What information does the actor hope to get from the system? Balances and so forth. You can often find additional use cases by focusing on the attributes of the objects in the domain. Customer has a name, a PIN, and an account number. Do you have use cases to manage these objects? An account has an account number, a balance, and a transaction history. Have these elements been captured in the use cases? After the customer used use cases have been explored in detail, the next step is to flesh out the list of use cases to develop a use case for each of the other actors. The following list shows a reasonable first set of the use cases in the ATM example. Customer checks his balances, customer deposits money into his account, customers withdraw money from his account, customers transfers money between accounts, customers open an account, customers close an account, customers logs into an account, customers check recent transactions, bank and clerk logs into special management account, bank clerks make an adjustment to a customer's account, a back office system updates a user's account based on external activity, changes in a user's account are reflected in a back office system the atm signals it is out of cash to disperse the bank technician fills the atm with cash and supplies creating the domain model after you have a first cut at your use cases the requirements document can be fleshed out with a detailed domain model the domain model is a document that captures all you know about the domain the field of business you are working in as part of your domain model you create domain objects that describe all the objects mentioned in your use case so far, the ATM example includes these objects, customer, bank personnel, back office systems, checking account, savings account, and so forth. For each of these domain objects, you need to ca capture essential data, such as the name of the object, for example, the customer account, and so forth. Whether the object is an actor, the object's principal attributes and behavior, and so forth. Many modeling tools support capturing this information in class descriptions, as shown how this information is captured with the rational Ross modeling tool. So they have the name, the class, and then the, is it an actor? Then, then uh, who has control of it? Is it public? Whatever, and they have the documentation. It's important to realize what is being described here is not the class that will be used in the design, but rather classes of objects in the required domain. This is the documentation of all the requirements that will be demanded of the system, not the documentation of how the system will meet these requirements. You can design, you could diagram the relationship among the objects in the domain of the ATM example using a UML diagram with the same diagram conventions that will be used later to describe the relationships among classes in the design. This is one of the greatest strengths of UML. You can use this similar representations at each stage of the project. For example, you can capture the checkings account, the savings account, that they are both specializations of the more general concept of the bank account by using the UML conventions for classes and generalization relationships. So in this diagram, the boxes are represent the various domain objects. The line with the arrowhead indicates a generalization. UML specifies that this line is drawn from the specialized class to the more general base class, thus both checking account and savings account point to bank account, indicating that each is a specialized form of bank account. So what they have here is they have a bank account, which is a domain object, and they have other domain objects such as checking account and savings account. So because of these checkings account and savings account are both bank accounts, it's just a more specialized bank account. They draw two these arrows and they connect them and point them to bank account. It's a generalization. Again, it is important to note that what is being drawn at this time are the relationships among classes in the requirements domain. Later, you might decide to have a checking account object in your design as well as a bank account object, and you can implement this relationship using inheritance. But these are design time decisions. At analysis time, you all you are documenting is your understanding of these requirements domain. UML is a rich modeling language, and you can capture many, any number of relationships. The principal relationships captured in analysis here are followed. Generalizations, containment, and association. So what we did before was a generalization. It is e equated with inheritance, but a sharp and meaningful distinction exists between the two. Generalizations 
to describe a relationship. Inheritance is the programming implementation of that generalization. Inheritance is how the generalization is manifested in code. The other side of the generalization coin is a specialization. A cat is a specialized form of animal. An animal is a generalized concept that unifies the cat and the dog. Specializations implies that the derived object is a subtype of the base object. Thus, a checking account is a bank account. The relationship is symmetri symmetrical. The bank account generalizes the common behavior and attributes of checking and savings accounts. So yeah, specialization is a checking account is a bank account. So what they did was, because the derived object is a subtype of the base class, they had the thing point to it. Okay, during domain analysis, you should seek to capture these relationships as they exist in the real world. Okay, so next is containment. Often one object is composed of many sub-objects. For example, a car is composed of a steering wheel, tires, doors, radio, and so forth. A checking account is composed of a balance, a transaction history, a customer ID, and so forth. The checking account has these items. The con a containment model has a relationship. UML illustrates the containment relationship by drawing a, di a line with a diamond form from containing the objects to the contained object. So here they have checking account and balance because a checking account has a balance they draw a, a, a diamond and then they draw an arrow so because the checking account has a balance they draw a diamond from the checking account to the balance the diagram in this suggests that the checking account has a balance you can combine these diagrams in a fairly complex set of relationships checking account savings account point are all bank accounts right and then a bank account has a balance and it's your transaction history. The diagram in figure 11.7 states that a checking account and savings account are both bank accounts because they all point to bank account. These two are both specialized forms of bank account. Yeah. So that they are both bank accounts. So that's where these point to it. A third relationship is called association. It is commonly captured in domain analysis as simple association. Association suggests that these two objects interact in some way and without being precise on what they might be. So this definition is more precise than the objects is in the design stage, but for analysis, it is only being suggested that A and B interact, but that neither contains the other or a specialization of the other. So all they do is just draw a line to each other. If A, if a and B interact with each other, all they do is just draw a line. So now we're going to establish scenarios. Now that you have a preliminary set of use cases and the tools with which to di diagram the relationship among objects in the domain, you are ready to formalize the use cases and give them more depth. Each use case can be broken down into a series of scenarios. A scenario is a description of a specific set of circumstances that to distinguish among the various elements of the use case. For example, the use case customer withdraws money from his account might have the following scenarios. Customer requests $300 which is withdrawn from checking, takes the cash from his cash slot, and then the system prints a receipt. Or the customer requests $300 withdrawal from checking, but his balance is $200. The customer is informed that there's not enough cash to accomplish the withdrawal. Or the customer requests $300 to withdraw from checking, but he has already withdrawn 100 today and the limit is 300 per day. So the customer is informed of the problem and he chooses to only withdraw 200. Customer requests 300 drawn from the checking, but the receipt roll is out of paper. Customer is informed of this problem and he chooses to proceed without a receipt and so forth. Each scenario explores a variation on the original use case. Often these scenarios are exceptions, conditions, not enough money in account, not enough money in the machine, so forth. Sometimes the variations explore nuances of the decisions in the use case themselves. For example, did the customer want to transfer money before making the withdrawal? Not every possible scenario must be explored. Rather, you are looking at the scenarios that tease out the requirements of the system or the details of the interactions with the actor. So, wow, that was a lot to take in. Basically, you have to write possible scenarios of what happens in your system that might happen for, every, for your use cases, okay, to help you out your use cases. Establishing guidelines. As part of your method, you need to create guidelines for documenting each scenario. You can capture these 
guidelines in your requirements document, typically you need to ensure that each scenario includes the following. Created conditions. What must be true for the scenario to begin? Triggers. What events cause the scenario to begin? What actions causes the actors to take? What results or changes are caused by the system? What feedback of the actors received? Whether repeating activities occur and what causes them to conclude? A description of the logical flow of the scenario. What causes the scenario to end? Post conditions. What must be true when the scenario is complete? In addition, you need to name each use case and each scenario. Thus, you have to have the situation. Use case customers withdraws cash. Scenario successfully withdrawn cash. Precondition customers already logged into the system. Trigger customer requests a withdrawal. Description customer chooses to withdraw cash from a checking account. Sufficient cash is in his account. Sufficient cash and receipt paper are in the ATM. Network is online and running. ATM asks the customer to indicate the amount of withdrawal and the customer asks for $300. A legal amount is withdrawn at this time. Machine dispenses $300, prints the receipt, and the customer takes the money and the receipt. Post conditions, customers is debited $300 and the customer has $300 in cash. So you have to write all of this, okay, for every use case, for every scenario, for every post condition, you need to write all of this. This use case can be shown with a simple diagram. Here's an actor that has a customer. He would put a circle for your use case. He withdraws cash. And then you have this line for an association. Little information is captured here except a high level abstraction of an interaction between an actor, the customer, and the system. The diagram becomes slightly more useful when you show the interaction among the use cases. I say only slightly more useful because two interactions are possible, uses and extends. The uses stereotype indicates that one use case is a subset, superset of another. For example, it is impossible to withdraw cash without first being logged in. This relationship can be shown in here. So the customer withdraws cash, but he has to be logged in first. So he uses lo the login use case. This figure indicates that the withdrawal cash uses the login use case and thus login is part of the withdrawal cash. The extends use case was intended to indicate conditional relationships and something akin to inheritance, but so much confusion exists in my object model and communication about the distinction between uses and extends that many developers have simply set aside extends, feeling that its meaning is not sufficiently well understood. Personally, I use extends when I other would otherwise copy and paste the entire use case in place, uh, and I use extends when I only use the use case under the certain definition. So, the interaction diagrams. Although the diagram of the use case itself might be a limited value, you can associate diagrams with the use case that can dramatically improve the documentation and understanding of the interactions. For example, you know that the withdrawal cash scenario represents the interactions among the following domain objects, customer, checking account, and their user interface. You can document this interaction with an interaction diagram. So the customer, okay, so the customer withdraws, requests a withdrawal, user interface, this is the ATM machine, shows the options, customer indicates the amount and the account. They check the balances and status and such, and then it goes to the checking account, then it returns the authorization, then it shows the debit. And then after that, it dispense cash. Customer required requests the receipt, and then it prints the receipt. This is an interaction diagram. It captures the details of the scenarios that might not be evident by reading the text, but the objects are interacting are the domain objects, and the entire UI interface was treated as a single object with only the specific bank account called out in any detail. This rather simple ATM example shows only a fanciful set of interactions, but nailing down the specifics of these interactions can be a powerful tool in understanding both the problem domain and the requirements of your new system. Okay, creating packages. Because you generate many use cases for any problem of a significant complexity, UML actually enables you to group your own use cases in packages. A package is a directory or folder folder it is a collection of modeling objects classes actors and so forth to manage the complexity of your use cases you can create packages aggregated by whatever characteristics make sense for your problem thus you can aggregate your use cases by account type everything affecting checkings or savings by credit or debit by customer type or by whatever characteristics make sense to you more important a use case 
can appear in different packages, allowing you great flexibility. Application analysis. In addition to creating use cases, requirements document must capture your customer's assumptions and any constraints and requirements concerning hardware and operating systems, security, performance, and so forth. These requirements are your particular customer's prerequisites. These things that you would normally determine during the design and implementation, but your clients have done it for you. By application requirements, sometimes called technical requirements, are often driven by the need to interface with existing systems. In this case, understanding what the existing systems do and how they work is an essential component of your analysis. Ideally, you anal analyze the problem, design the solution, and then decide which platform and operating system best fits your design. That scenario is as ideal as it is rare. More often, clients has a standing investment in a particular operating system or a hardware platform. The client's business plans depends on your software running on the existing existing system and you must capture these requirements early and design accordingly. The systems anal analysis. Some software is written to stand alone interacting only with the end user. Often however you will be called on to interface to an existing system. Systems analysis is the process of collecting all the details of the system with which you will interact. Will your new system be a server providing service to the existing system or will it be a client? Will you be able to negotiate an interface between the systems or must you adapt, ad ad adapt to an existing standard? Will the other system be stable or must you continually hit a moving target? These and unrelated questions must be answered in your analysis phase. Before you begin to design your new system, in addition, you need to try to capture the constraints and limitations implicit in interacting with the other systems. Will they slow down the responses of your system? Will they put the high demands on your new system, resources, and computing time? All right, planning your documents. After you understand what your system must do and how it must behave, it is time to take a first stab at creating a time and budget document. Often the client dictates the timeline. You have 18 months to get this done. Ideally, you, deter you examine the requirements and est estimate the time it will take to design and implement the solution. That is the ideal. The practical reality is that most systems come with an imposed time limit and cost limit. And the real trick is to figure out how much of that required functionality you can build in the allotted time and at the allotted cost. Here are some guidelines to keep in mind while you create your project budget and timeline. You are given a range. The outer number is probably optimistic. Liberty's Law states that everything that takes longer than you expect, even if you take into account Liberty's Law. Given these realities, it is imperative that you should prioritize your work so that most important tasks are done first. You should not expect to have time to finish, so don't procrastinate. It is that simple. It is important that you, when you run out of time, you have works that is adequate enough for the first release. If you are building a bridge and run out of time, if you didn't get a chance to put in the bicycle path, that isn't that bad. But if you could still open the bridge and start collecting tolls, if you run out of time you are, and you're only halfway across the river, that is not good. An essential thing is to know about planning documents is that they are generally wrong. This early in the process, it is virtually impossible to offer a reliable estimate of the duration of the project. After you have the requirements, you get a good handle on how long the, the design will take, a fair estimate of how long the implementation will take, and a reasonable guesstimate of the testing time. Then you can allow yourself at least 20 to 25 percent of the wiggle room, which you can tighten as you move forward through the iteration and learn more. The inclusion of the wiggle room in your planning document is not an excuse to avoid planning documents. It is merely a warning not to rely on them too early. On. As the project goes forward, you'll strengthen your understanding of how the system works and your estimates will become increasingly precise. Visualizations. The final piece of the requirements about documentation is the visualization. The visualization is a fancy name for the diagrams, pictures, screenshots, prototypes, and any other visual representations that can help you think and through the design graphical interf interface of your product. For many large prod projects, you can develop a full prototype to help you and your customers understand how the system will behave. On some teams, the prototype becomes a living requirements document. The real system is designed to implement the functionality between in the document, in the prototype, my, my bad, prototype. 
artifacts at the end of each phase of the analysis and design you will create a sequence of documents called artifacts the table shows one of the artifacts in the analysis phase several groups use these artifacts the customers will use the documents to be certain that you understand what they need end users will need to use them to give feedback and guidance to the project the project team will use them to design and implement the code many of these documents also provide material crucial to both your documentation team and a quality assurance to tell them how the system ought to behave. So you have artifact user case report document detailing the use cases, the scenario, stereotypes, preconditions, post conditions, and visualizations. You have the domain analysis, the document and a diagram that describes the relationships among each domain objects, the analysis collaboration diagrams, the diagrams are presenting interactions among objects in the problem domain. The analysis activity diagrams. The activity diagrams describe the interactions among objects in the problem domain. Systems analysis. The report and diagrams describing low level and hardware systems on which a project will be built. Application and analysis document. The report and diagrams describing the customer's requirement specific to this particular project. The operational constraints report, the report describing performance characteristics and constraints imposed by the client, cost and maintaining the, the document, report with charts, graphs, indicating project scheduling, milestones and costs. Holy crap. Okay. The next is the design phase, step three. The analysis focuses on understanding the problem domain, whereas the next step of the processes design and focuses on creating the solution design is a process of transforming your understanding of the requirements into a model that can be implemented in software the result of this process is the production of a design document a design document can be divided into two sections class design architectural mechanisms the class design section in turn is divided into static diagrams which in details of various classes and their relationships and characteristics in dynamic class Dynamic design, which is how classes interact. Architectural me mechanisms section of the design document provides details about how you will implement an object's persistence, concurrency, distributed object system, and so forth. The rest of the lesson now focuses on the class design aspect of the design documentation. Other lessons in this result of the book explains elements of how to implement various architectural mechanisms. So, what are classes? As C++, you have now known how to use classes. Formal design methods require you to separate the concept of the class from the concept of the design class, although they are in intimately related. The C++ class you write in code is the Im implementation of the class you design. This is the one-to-one -one relationship. Each class in your design corresponds to a class in your code, but don't confuse one or the other. It is Certainly possible to implement your design class in another language and the syntax of the class definitions might change. So that being said, most of the time these classes are discussed without distinguishing them because the dis differences are highly abstract. When you say that your model, the cat class, will have a meow method, understand that this means that you put a meow method in your C++ class as well. You capture the design models classes in UML diagrams and you capture the implementations C++ classes in code that can be compiled. The distinction is meaningful, yet subtle. subtle. In any case, the biggest stumbling block for many novices is finding the initial set of classes and understanding what makes a well-defined design class. One simple technique suggests writing out the user case scenarios and thus creating a class for every noun. Considering the following user case scenario, oh, the use case scenario, my bad, use case. Customers choose to withdraw cash from checking. Sufficient cash is in the account. Sufficient cash and receipts are in the account. In the ATM, the network is up and running. The ATM asks the customer to indicate an amount for the withdrawal. The customer asks $300. Legal amount is to withdraw at this time. The machine dispenses $300, prints a receipt, and the customer takes the money in the receipt. So you might pull out the scenario of the following classes. Customer cash, checking, account, receipts, ATM, network, amount, withdrawal, machine, money. You might then aggregate 
the synonyms to create this list and then create classes for each of the nouns customer cash money amount withdrawal checking account receipts atm machine network this is not a bad way to start as far as it goes you might then go on to diagram the very ob obvious relationships among these classes wow so checking account is an account so you draw a line customer nothing so far atm <sighs> okay a network has an atm so they put the dot 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 line the atm wait what okay yeah atm has cash the no, atm dispenses cash atm dispenses receipts so they both have those things huh okay transformations when you what you begin to do in the preceding section was not so much extract the nouns from the scenarios as to begin transforming objects from the domain analysis into objects in the design. That is a fine first step. Often many of the objects in the domain have surrogates in the design. An object is called a surrogate to distinguish between the actual physical receipt dispensed by an ATM and the object in your code that is merely an intellectual abstraction implemented in code. You will likely find that most of the domain objects have a representation in the design. That is a one-to-one correspondence exists between the object design the domain object and the, and the design object okay other times however single domain object is represented in this design by an entire series of design objects and at a times a series of domain objects might be represented by a single design object so note in the finger account checking account has already been captured as specialization so we see that oh what else you didn't set out to find the generalization relationships, but this one is self-evident, so it has been captured. Similarly, from the domain analysis, you know that the ATM dispenses both cash and receipts, so that information has been captured immediately into the design. The relationship between customer and checking account is less obvious. Such a, such a relationship exists, but the details are not obvi obvious, so you hold them off. So yeah, customer and other transformations. After you transform the domain objects, you can begin to look at other useful de design type uh, time objects. Often each actor has a class. A uh, good starting phase is with the inter interface between your new system and any, ex any existing systems. It should be encapsulated in an interface class. However, be careful when considering databases and other external Storage media, it is generally better to make it a responsibility of each class to manage its own persistence. That is how it is stored and retrieved between user sessions. Those design classes, of course, can use custom common classes for accessing files or databases, but most commonly the operating system or the database vendor provides these to you. These interfaces classes allow you to encapsulate your system's interactions with other systems. Thus, shield your code from the changes in the other systems. Interface classes allow you to change your own design or to accommodate changes in the design of other systems without breaking the rest of the code. As long as the two systems continue to support the agreed on interface, they can change independently of one another. Okay, data manipulation. Similarly, you can you might need to create classes for data manipulation if you have to transform from data from one format to another such as fahrenheit to celsius or english to metric you might want to encapsulate these transformations behind a specialized class you can use this technique when converting data into required formats for other systems or for a transmission over the internet in short any time you must manipulate data into a specified Format you encapsulate the protocol behind a data manipulation class. Okay, so create a class to We need you need to change your data format, whatever Views and reports. Ooh, damn Every view or report your system generates or if you generate any reports is a candidate for a class The rules behind the report are both how the information is gathered and how it is displayed can be productively encapsulated into a view class. Okay. Devices. If your system interacts with 
or manipulates devices such as printers, cameras, modems, scanners, and so forth. The specifics of the device protocol ought to be encapsulated in a class. Again, by creating classes for the interface to the new device, you can plug in new devices with new protocols and not break any of the rest of your code. Just create a new interface class that supports the same interface and off you go. Okay. Wow. Building the static model. When you have established your primary preliminary set of classes, it is time to begin modeling their relationship and interactions. For the purpose of clarity, the static model is explained first and then the dynamic model. In the actual design process, you will move freely between the static and dynamic model. Filling in details of both and in fact adding new classes and sketching them in as you learn from each. Static model focuses on three areas of concern, responsibilities, attributes, and relationships. The most important of these and the one you focus on for is the set of responsibilities of each class. The most important guiding principle is this. Each class must be responsible for one thing. That is not to say that each class has only one method. Far from it. Many classes will have dozens of methods, but all these methods must be coherent and cohesive. That is, they must all relate to one another and contribute to the class's ca capability to accomplish a single area of responsibility. In a well-designed system, each object is an instance of a well-defined, well-understood class that is responsible for one area of concern. Classes typically delegate extraneous responsibilities to other related classes. By creating the classes that have only a single area of concern, you promote the creation of highly maintainable code. Okay. To get a handle on the responsibilities of your classes, you might find it beneficial to begin your design work with the use of R CRC cards. Whoa, what is that? Holy crap, okay, using CRC cards. CRC stands for Class Responsibility and Collaboration. A CRC card is nothing more than a 4x6 index card. This simple technique enables you to work with other people in understanding the prelim primary responsibilities of your initial set of classes. Oh, this is interesting. You assemble a single stack of blank 4x6 index cards around your conference table for a series of RCR card sessions. How to conduct an RCR, a CRC session. The large project component, each CRC session should be attended ideally by a group of three to six. Any more becomes unwieldy. You should be have a facilitator whose job it is to keep the session on track and to help participants capture what they learn. At least one senior software architect must be present. Ideally, someone with significant experience in object-oriented analysis and design. In addition, you need to include at least one or two domain experts who understand the system requirements and who can provide expert advice in how things ought to work. The most essential ingredient in the CRC session is the conspicuous absence of managers. Wow, this is a creative freewheeling session that must be uncumbersome by the need to impress a boss. Okay, the goal here is to explore, take risk, and tease out responsibilities of these classes and understand how they interact with one another. You begin the session by assembling your group around a conference table with a stack of cards. On each top of the RCR card, CRC card, my bad, you write the name of a single class, draw the line from the center of the card, and write responsibilities on the left and the right. Begin by filling out the cards most important classes you identified. For each card, write one sentence on the back. You must also capture other classes specialization if that is obvious at the time you're working with the CRC card. Just write super class down below and fill out the class from which this class derives. Wow, okay. So, this is a nice thing you could do. It's a good activity to do. If you want, really want to figure out your relationships between your classes. But yeah. Let's see. Wow. Okay. So we'll just go over this whole thing. And then after that, that's it. So it's almost over.
So for CRC, you basically focus on responsibilities, identify the responsibilities of each class, pay attention to the attributes, capture only the most essential and obvious attributes as you go. The important work is to identify the responsibilities. It, if in full, fulfilling a responsibility, the class must delegate work to another class, you must capture that information under collaborations. As you progress, keep an eye on your list of responsibilities. As if you run out of the room on your four by six card, it might take some sense to wonder whether you're asking this class to do some too much. Remember, each class should be responsible for one general area of work and the various responsibilities must be cohesive and coherent. That is, that is they must work together to accomplish the overall responsibility of the class. At this point, you do not want to focus on relationships, nor do you want, want to worry about the class interface on which the methods will be public or private. The focus is on what each class does. Anthropomorphic class and use case driven. A key feature of our uh, CRC cards is to make them anthropomorphic. That is, you attribute human-like qualities to each class. Here's how it works. After you have a preliminary set of classes, return to your CRC scenarios. Divide the class, the cards around the table arbitrarily and walk through scenarios together. For example, return to the following scenario. Customer withdraws from the checking and then yada, yada, yada. The machine dispenses 300 and gets it. So assume there are five participants in this, this session. Amy, the facilitator, the designer, Barry, the lead programmer, Charlie, the client, and Doris, the domain expert, edit a program. Amy holds up the card representing checking account and says, I tell the customer how much money is available. He asked me to give him 300. I sent a message to the dispenser telling him to give out $300 cash. Barry holds up his, in his card and says, I'm the dispenser. I spit out the $300 and send Amy a message telling her to decrement her balance by $300. Who do I tell that the machine now has $300 loss? Do I keep track of that? Charlie says, I think we need an object to keep track of the cash in the machine. Ed says, no, the dispenser should know how much cash it has. That's part of being a dispenser. Amy disagrees. No, someone has to coordinate the dispensing of the cash. The dispenser needs to know wh whether cash is available and whether the customer has done enough in the account and it has to count out the money and how much, how to close the draw. It should delegate responsibility for a tra eat cap tracking the cash on hand and the internal account. Whoever has the cash on hand should notify the back office when it's time to be re refilled. Otherwise, that, that's asking the dispenser to do too much. So this discussion continues. By holding up cards and interacting with one another, the requirements and the opportunities to delegate are teased out. Each class comes live and its responsibilities are clarified. When the group becomes bogged down on design questions, the facilitator can make a decision and help the group move on. Okay, so there are limitations of using these cards. Although they are a powerful way to get started with design, they have limitations. The first problem is that they don't scale well. In a very complex project, you can be overwhelmed with RCR cards. Or CRC cards, my bad. Keeping track of them can be very difficult. CRC cards also don't capture the, the, the relationship among classes. Although it is true that the collaborators are noted, the nature of the collaboration is not modeled well. Look at the CRC cards. You can't tell whether a class is aggregate one another, who creates who, and so forth. CRC cards also don't capture attributes, so it is difficult to go from CRC cards to code. Most importantly, CRC cards are static. Although you can act out the interactions among the classes, the CRC cards themselves do not capture this information. In short, the CRC cards are a good place to start, but you need to move the classes into the UML if you are going to build a robust and complete model of your diet design. Although, although the transition into CRC, into UML is not difficult, it is a one-way street. After you move your classes into UML diagrams, there is no way turning back. You set aside the CRC cards and don't come back to them. It is simply too difficult to keep the two models synchronized with one another. Transforming CRC cards into UML. Each CRC card can be translated directly into the class model with the UML. Responsibilities are translated into class methods and whatever attribute you have captured are added as well. The class de definition from the back of the card is put into the class documentation. Here the figure shows the relationship between the checking account CRC card and the UML class created from that card. 
Okay, so they have class checking account, the super class is an account. So checking account is an account. Responsibility keeps track of the current account, accepts deposits and transfers in, writes checks, transfers the cash out, keep current days ATM withdrawal balance. Collaborations, other accounts, back office system, cash dispenser. Wow. Class relationships. After the classes are in UML, you can begin to turn your attention to the relationships among the various classes. The principal relationships you'll model all the far are the following: generalization, association, aggregation, and composition. Generalization relationship is implemented in C through public in inheritance. From a design perspective, however, you focus less on the mechanism and more on the semantics. That is what the technique implies. You examine the generalization relationship in the analysis phase, but now turn your attention to the objects in your de design rather than just the, the objects in the domain. Your efforts should now be to factor out common functionality in related classes into base classes that can encapsulate the shared responsibilities. When you factored out common functionality, move that functionality out of the specialization classes and up to a more generalized class. Thus, if you notice that both your checking and your savings account need methods for transferring money in and out, you can move the transfer funds method up to the account base class. The more you factor out the derived class, the more polymorphic your design will be. One of the capabilities available in C++, which is not available in Java, is multiple inheritance. Uh, it's similar in Java, but it's limited for the, cap the capability of multiple in interfaces. Multiple inheritance allows the class to inherit from more than one base class, bringing in the members and methods of two or more classes. Experience shows that you should use multiple inheritance judiciously because it can complicate your design and your implementation. Many problems initially solved with multiple inheritance are today solved using aggregation. That being said, multiple inheritance is a powerful tool in your design might require that a special single class specializes the behavior of two or more classes. So multiple inheritance versus container is an object the sum of its parts does it make sense to model a car object as a specialization a steering wheel door and tire no no it isn't I, I, that wouldn't make sense i don't think that would make sense uh it is important to come back to your fundamentals public in inheritance should always be a model generalization the expression is is a relationship if you want to model this that has a relationship the car has a steering row you wheel you use aggregation so use the diamond car has a steering wheel, car has a door, car has a tire. The diagram indicates that a car has a steering wheel, four wheels, and two to five doors. This is a more accurate model of the relationship among a car and its parts. Note, notice that the, di the diamond in the diagram is not filled in. That is because the relationship is model aggregation, not composition. Composition implies the control for the lifetime of the object. Car, although car has tires and doors, the tires and doors can exist before they are part of the car and can, and can continue to exist after they are no longer part of the car. This model's composition. This model says that the body is not only an aggregation of the head and two arms and legs, but that these objects, head, arms, and legs, are created when the body is created and disappear when the body disappears. That is, they have no independent existence. The body is composed of these things and their lifetimes are intertwined. Okay, so composition is that after card the body disappears, the head, arms, and legs disappear. Uh, in aggregation, they're independent things. So like if the car disappears, the steering wheel might still be alive. They can continue to exist after they're no longer part of the car. So yeah, if you like, you could take up off the steering wheel and it's an independent thing from the car. Whereas if you take off the head from the body, uh, no, it's not independent anymore. Discriminator, discriminators and prototypes. How might you design the classes required to reflect the various model lines of a typical car manufacturer? Suppose you've been hired to design a system of Acme motors, motors which currently manufactures five cars. The Pluto, the Venus, the Mars, Jupiter, and the Earth. You might start by creating subtypes of the car that reflect the various models and then create instances of each car as it rolls off the assignment line. Okay, so all these are special, specialized cars. How are the models different? As stated, they are differentiated by the 
engine size, the body type, and the performance characteristics. These various discriminating characteristics can be mixed and matched to create various models. This can be modeled in a UML's discriminator stereotype. Okay, so these things are different for each car. Okay, the model in the figure indicates that classes can be derived from the car based on mixing and matching three discriminating attributes. The size of the engine, okay, size of the engine dictates how powerful the car is. The performance characteristics, characteristics indicate how sporty the car is, okay, and thus you have a powerful sporty wagon and a low power family sedan and so forth. Okay, okay, that makes sense, okay. Leisure attribute can be implemented with a single numerator. Thus, in code, the body type might be implemented with the following statement. Body type, sedan, coupe, uh, minivan, station wagon. It might turn out, however, that a simple value is insufficient to model a particular discriminator. For example, the performance characteristics might be rather complex. In this case, the discriminator can be modeled as a class. The discrimination can be encapsulated in an informed instance of that type. Thus, the car model might have the performance characteristics as a performance type, which contains information about where the engine shifts and how fast it can turn. The UML stereotype for a car that encapsulates a discriminator and that can be used to create instances of the car are that are logically different types. So a sports car versus luxury car is a very different powerful type. In this case, the performance class is a power type for a car. When you insta instantiate car, you also instantiate a performance object and you create a given performance object with a given car. Wow. Okay. Prototypes enable you to create a variety of logical types without using inheritance. You can thus manage a large and complex set of types without the combinatorial real explosion you might encounter with inheritance. Typically, you implement the powerful the pro power type in C++ with pointers. In this case, the car class holds a pointer to an instance of performance characteristics class. Holy crap. Okay, yeah. Keep in mind that the practice of creating new types in this way, run type can reduce the benefits of C++ strong typing, which the compiler can enforce the correctness in a class relationships. Therefore, use it carefully. So it's better the relationship between a car object and its car object power type could be like this. Wow, okay. Pu a class car, public vehicle. Okay, yeah. Point it to a performance object. As a final note, power types enable you to create new types, not just instances at runtime, because each logical type is differentiated only by the attributes of the associated power type these attributes can be parameters to the power types constructor this means that you can at runtime create new types of car on the fly that is by passing different engine sizes and shift points to the power type you can effectively create a new performance characteristic by assigning these characteristics to various cars you can effectively enlarge the set of types of cars at runtime oh okay okay there's also something called the dynamic model. In addition to modeling the relationship among the classes, it is critical to model how they interact. For example, a checking account can interact with the customer to fulfill the withdrawal cash use case. You now return to the kinds of sequence diagrams first used in analysis, but now flesh out the details based on the methods describing the classes. So here, it, it, this was the same thing that we had before. It was just a dynamic model. We're just printing out the relationship. This simple interaction diagram shows the interaction between the design classes over time. It suggests the ATM delegates to checking account class all responsibilities for managing the balance while the checking account calls on the ATM manage to display to the user. Interaction diagrams comes in very various flavors. One is a sequence diagram, another one. So the top one was a sequence diagram. So you one goes to the next one, goes back to the previous one. Yeah. Another one view on the same information is provided by collaboration is a collaboration diagram. Sequence diagrams emphasize the sequence of events over time. Collaboration diagrams emphasize the timeless interactions between the classes. You can gener generate a collaboration diagram directly from a sequence diagram. These tools such as rational 
rows automate the task with the click of a button. So this is better because it's well, this is not necessarily better. This is just that it shows uh, the sequ uh, it's a timeless interaction. That's what it is. And uh, here, this is more focused on the time, like what happens after you say the customer checks, balances, it gets it, displays it, stuff like that. So this one, it's timeless. Checks it, bads, balance it, displays it. It draws, caps, dispenses it, prints it. State transition diagrams. As you come to understand the interactions among the objects, you also have to understand the various possible states of each individual object. You can model the transitions among the various states in a state diagram. So this figure shows the various states of the customer account class as the customer logs into the system. Every state diagram begins with a single start state and ends with zero or more end states. The individual states are named and the transitions might be labeled. The guard indicates a condition that might be satisfied for an object to move from one state to another. Okay, so state not logged in, gets logged in, get password, log in. Yeah, that's basically it. Each of these are start, state transition, state, the guard. This is this has to be uh, valid before it moves on to the next state. Super states. Customers can change her mind at any time and decide not to log in. She can do this after her swipe to identify her account or after she enters her password. In each case, system must accept her request to cancel and return to a not logged in state. Wow, so start, not logged in. Get the account info, canceled, go back here. Get password, canceled, log in. As you could see in a more complicated diagram, the canceled state quickly becomes a distraction. That is particularly annoying because canceling is an exceptional condition that should not ha be given prominence in the diagram. You can simplify this diagram by using a super state. Okay. Oh yeah, because the cancel, so you don't have to have canceled on both of these. Just have them canceled over here. Okay, implementation, testing, and rollout. The remaining stages are important but not covered because the rest of the book covers these details. Uh, the testing and rollout are their own complex disciplines and their own demands. However, the detailed coverage of them is beyond the scope of the book. Nevertheless, don't forget that carefully testing your class in isolation is a key to determine you have a successful design. So iterations in the rational design process, their workflows that work at different levels of the Inception, elaboration, construction, to transition. For instance, business model peaks during inception that can occur during construction as review of past area. Within each phase, such as construction, the first iteration of the construction, for instance, the core functions of the system can be developed. In the second iteration, the, those capabilities can be de 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 deepened and added. In the third iteration, more stuff can happen. Wow. So that was all the design process and the models. Sorry guys, I couldn't I, I couldn't really explain it well without without just reading it off of the book. Anyway, rate, comment, subscribe, I'll check you guys later. Peace.